Our subject tonight is, of course, of great interest. Um, there are many generalizations about American foreign policy which are made very easily, including the difficulty of the United States to uh, effectively conduct diplomacy with Marxist-oriented states. And uh, the People's Republic of Mozambique is perhaps a kind of exception to this, this uh, often made generalization. That in itself, I think, makes our program tonight interesting. And certainly, Mozambique plays an important role in the region of South Africa, a part of the world which is of great interest to the United States, and uh, making the program of double interest. And of course, uh, all nations which are struggling to move from a position of colonialism uh, to a position of independence, which serves the uh, well-being of the politically and economically of its people is of, of interest as well. For those and other reasons, this is a fact fascinating subject this evening. We're delighted that the Ambassador of Mozambique is with us. Ambassador Farrell joined the Mozambique Liberation Front as a young man in 1963. He was in Switzerland studying mechanical engineering from 1965 to 1970. He taught in the secondary school system of Tanzania for four years, and he represented the Mozambique Liberation Front in Algeria, 1974 to 75, with, of course, the independence of his nation occurring in 1975. He was a mechanical engineer for what I think is the major national railroad company in Mobutu in 1975 to 76. He served as secretary to the Council of Ministers, 76 to 78. Then he served as Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and then Secretary of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The relations of Mozambique and the United States have been up and down and up again, and he was selected as the first ambassador of his nation to the United States and Canada in 1983 and has been here since. Uh, I know we look forward to what would be a most interesting presentation it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you at this time Ambassador, the Ambassador of the People's Republic of Mozambique, Valeriano Ferral. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Bird. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm really honored to be here today. And, uh, grateful for this opportunity that I have to discuss with you one of the hottest uh, subjects that we have in foreign policy today. Uh, that's the situation that prevails in Southern Africa, uh, in general, Southern Africa in general, and particularly in Mozambique. Mozambique, as you know, is uh, one of the countries in the region that has, uh, is uh, undergoing a very difficult period of our history because uh, of the destabilization that is carried out by South Africa in my country. This problem that is exists in the area does not concern only Mozambique, does not concern only South Africa, does not concern only Botswana or uh, Zimbabwe or Swaziland or Lesotho, it concerns all the humanity, all the mankind, because it is a problem that puts the, the, it is put to the conscience of the people, the honest people, the good people of this world. The same way there was a problem in Europe in the, in the 40s, 
called nazism, we have today this problem called apartheid and with all its consequences in Southern Africa. This is not a problem of South Africans only, of black South Africans and white South Africans. It is also a problem of all mankind in this world. If you analyze the situation in Southern Africa without any preconceived ideas uh, or bias, uh, we will always arrive to the same conclusion. The root cause of the climate of tension and confrontation in South Africa and in the region as a well, whole is the apartheid system. A system wherein a small group of people who happen to be white and believe in white supremacy are determined to maintain their domination over the vast majority, which is the black population. This is the root cause of the almost daily riots we see in Soweto, in Guguleto, in many other townships in the different towns and, and cities of South Africa, and not the intervention of the neighboring countries as, as the South African government wishes to convince everyone else. Soon after our independence, our people and our government stood up to one of the, our principles and gave support to the liberation, war, to the liberation of, the, of Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, as you know, it had uh, this, uh, had, uh, it was called at the time Southern Rhodesia, and they had a minority, white minority regime there, rebel white minority regime, led by Ian Smith. And uh, we complied uh, with the Security Council's decision to apply mandatory sanctions against uh, Rhodesia and we supported the liberation uh, movements of Zimbabwe by giving them rare bases in Mozambique. As you know, by 1980, we all celebrated Zimbabwe's independence. But in the process, We lost well above $550 million US dollars, both in revenues and both in properties and infrastructures that were destroyed. We, I mean Mozambique. However, the white minority regime in Rhodesia, and that in South Africa also, would not, forgiving, uh, would not forgive us for living up to our moral obligation. In fact, uh, the Rhodesian intelligence created uh, during that period of the uh, liberation war of Zimbabwe, a group called, uh, at the time it was a free Mo uh, Mozambique movement, uh, more recently it's called Mozambique National Resistance, or in the Portuguese acronym, RENAMO. This group was made up of Mozambicans that had served uh, formerly in the Portuguese colonial army. Uh, it was in included, also, included also Portuguese mercenaries uh, most of them former settlers in uh, Mozambique, and uh, many of those uh, members of the Portuguese secret police called PIDE, they were gathered by the, the, the Central Intelligence Office of Southern Rhodesia. They were then given training, weapons, logistical support, and they were sent back to Mozambique to destabilize the country, to create problems to uh, our army behind uh, in the rear lines in order that we, we would be fighting them in Mozambique and the liberation could not progress in Zimbabwe. But nevertheless, Zimbabwe became independent. And when it became independent, we legitimately expected that we would have peace and that uh, we, would, we would be able to build our country. And this hope was short-lived. In fact, uh, after Lancaster House and before the independence of Zimbabwe, there was what we could call a transitional period. And during this period, these uh, MNR uh, groups were flown, some of them, to, 
to Transvaal in South Africa. Others were taken by lorry to South Africa. And then South Africa took them over, sponsored them, gave them more training, more financing, more uh, logistical support, and they start the, the big destabilization uh, the wide, at a wider scale in Mozambique, spreading them over nearly all the provinces of Mozambique. Uh, This can, I'm telling this, and uh, you may tell, wow, this is the boss of Mozambique, and he must tell or uh, he speak what the government says. I would like to refer to you, in fact, uh, the book uh, where we can read this in detail. Uh, the, and the author is Mr. Ken Flowers, the former chief of the Rosigian security. And he, he published recently a book. He, is, he died already, but he, uh, there was a book that was edited, uh, uh, and its name is uh, Serving Secretly, an intelligent chief on record, Rhodesia into Zimbabwe, 1964-1981. Well, this conflict uh, in Mozambique uh, is uh, fomented, by, fomented by South Africa. And why Mozambique? If you look into a in the map of the area, you will see Mozambique as a strategic location. Uh, its ports uh, serve uh, the vast majority or all the interland countries, Malawi, Zamb Zambia, Zimbabwe, Swaziland, Botswana, even southern Zaire, used to export their uh, mineral wealth through the ports of Beira and Maputo. And uh, besides Beira and Maputo, we have also the ports of the port of Nakala in the north that links uh, by rail to Malawi. These rails are the cheapest and uh, the shortest routes to those countries to the sea. Yet uh, the large, uh, there is today a large percentage of their exports and imports that are being transported through a um, through the network. Uh, the South African network of transport and communications, which is much longer and more onerous, as you can imagine. For instance, Malawi alone spends more extra uh, 100 million US dollars in transportation costs by using the South African ports. There is this economic aspect. If Mozambique would uh, no, be used uh, by the, all those countries as uh, their normal route, South Africa would lose hundreds of millions of dollars per year in terms of transport and, uh, and transport of goods. But uh, there is another aspect which is uh, more important, and that is that if South Africa succeeds to block the system of transport and communications of Mozambique, all those countries will be forced to rely only upon the southern route only to, through South Africa to the harbors of Durban, Port Elizabeth, East London, or even Cape Town. And then South Africa will tell them, to all of them or any one of them, how do you do this or else? And then they will be completely dominated, both politically and economically. But in Mozambique, you know, we have a very special <laughs> uh, uh, way of seeing things, perhaps, and uh, we found that we should find uh, uh, some kind of modus vivendi with South Africa. And we signed uh, in 1984 a, an accord, an agreement uh, uh, of non-aggression and good neighborliness with South Africa, in which, uh, brief, in brief, uh, both countries uh, uh, decided that, uh, agreed that the, none of the countries should be utilizing, allowed utilization of their, ter their territory to destabilize, to generate violence in the other country. We have complied with what we, uh, what we uh, with the provisions of the agreement, but the South African side, no, they didn't, and they persist still in supporting the terrorists there. Well, the, perhaps the South Africans believe that uh, by preventing, by destabilizing the neighbors, the, it, they, would be able, they will be able to prevent uh, 
the end of apartheid. If the problem is, uh, the, if the problem is in, in South Africa, the solution to the problem will be found only in South Africa, not outside, not in the neighboring countries, not in the United States, not in London, in South Africa. The government there should, uh, in fact, uh, discuss with all the true South African leaders what they want really to do in South Africa. If they want to destroy that country, or if they want to build, continue to build a prosperous and united South Africa that will distribute, uh, will uh, share their wealth, uh, its wealth with everyone in the country and not only to this minority. For that, of course, they, there are conditions that they must meet. Uh, they must, the government must declare its uh, will uh, to dismantle uh, apartheid. They must take immediately some measures to approve this will and they must so mainly release Nelson Mandela and the other political leaders of the South African people that are in jail, most of, many of them for more than 20 years. This uh, agreement, uh, the Inkomati agreement, in fact, in our uh, view, it was to bring about peace in Mozambique, and it was with this aim that we signed it. We have tried uh, since not before the that uh, when we signed the, the when we participated in the La Casa House discussions for the Zimbabwean independence. We, do, we did also advise both the British government and uh, the liberation movements and uh, how to reach uh, this agreement that uh, allowed fin finally Zimbabwe to become independent. And we worked closely with the United States on that. My president, uh, the late Samora Machel, and President Carter at the time worked uh, together. They exchanged messages, uh, and, uh, and, to th and they contributed on their, uh, uh, by their own uh, the, but this way the, to help uh, Mrs. Thatcher to, uh, to solve the problem there. We also participate uh, as actively as we can in the process of dialogue between the United States and Angola. They, again, it is because we want to see peace in Angola. In fact, uh, we have a regional approach uh, to, what we, uh, to the cooperation in, the, the, in uh, our region there, and uh, that's why we are uh, through uh, the SADC group, uh, uh, SADC Association. SADC stands for Southern Africa Development uh, Coordinating Conference uh, that uh, gathers nine independent uh, countries in the region. We are trying to develop our economies. Uh, to benefit our peoples there. And we believe that this cooperation will bring a regional solution to regional problems. Looking back into our brief history, and uh, we are independent only 12 years now, 12 and, and a half years, we are really indeed very proud of our record in fostering peace and cooperation in the Southern Africa region. Uh, let us speak a little about the relations with the United States, uh, which uh, we believe that our, our relations are on a sound footing. Uh, we believe that the administration understands Mozambique and uh, has sought to support our uh, economy with uh, uh, aid, uh, which goes mainly to the private sector. Uh, the United States also supports Mozambique uh, in the difficult moments when we have droughts and uh, in terms of food aid, uh, mainly going to the rural areas. Uh, recently, the U.S. Congress uh, has adopted a, a joint resolution uh, concerning assistance to Mozambique uh, without conditionalities. And uh, on our part, we tell the American side that we are, our doors are wide open to American, for the American presence in, uh, in areas which the two sides uh, could deem appropriate. Uh, 
we have also, and I would like to speak this, uh, say this because, you know, Mozambique is tagged more than often as being a Soviet puppet, a Soviet uh, satellite. And uh, I would like to give some information about our relations with other countries besides the Soviet, uh, uh, Soviet uh, bloc. Uh, we have a very strong cooperation with Italy, with France, with Britain, with the Nordic countries, with Holland, to a lesser extent with uh, Portugal, with West Germany, with Brazil, uh, with Japan uh, still small, with the United States still small. Uh, last year we had the visit of uh, the West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl. Next this year the King of Spain will visit Mozambique, uh, as well as the, His Holiness the Pope uh, and the Prime Minister of Portugal. Just last week, uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Bavaria, Franz Strauss, was in Maputo for a two-day visit. We have uh, military cooperation, not only with the Soviet Union, but also with Britain. We send officers to be trained at Sandhurst. We have officers being trained in Zimbabwe by the uh, British officers, and uh, also British officers training some uh, troops in Mozambique. Uh, we have uh, agreements that are being worked out uh, with, uh, in this field, military field, with Portugal, Spain, France, Italy. Right now there is a military delegation of, uh, of the military from Portugal to discuss uh, the development of the, our cooperation with Portugal. Well, this is, uh, in fact, uh, the logic outcome of our policy and uh, we are proving that we are really independent and that we are truly non-aligned. We have many problems in terms of economy, the destructions that are uh, done by this MNR group are not only related to, to killing people, mutilating people, raping women, it's also destruction, destruction of projects, economic projects. It's also the destruction of big factories. Just to give two examples, uh, uh, they have destroyed two big factories of sugar that uh, lowered our production to f uh, about 50%. In 1986, they destroyed five tea processing factories, destroying completely our capacity to export tea. It's $40 million worth of equipment. We have agreed with the IMF and the World Bank, and we are applying a very strict economic program, which is already paying some results. We have devaluated our currency from 40 metikais for one dollar to 450 metikais. The involvement also of uh, the international community in the support of this program is very important, and we are confident with the, with the support of the, the, the international community will be able to overcome those economic problems that will allow also us to give to the Mozambican people a better chance to have those things that are legitimate aspirations of any people of, an, of any country of this world. I would like to stop here, and I would like uh, to thank you also for your attention. I hope that my English was uh, not so difficult. I make mistakes regularly, and uh, that's not my, it's not my language. And I would like to uh, thank you for your indulgence. Thank you very much. The, the ambassador has agreed to answer questions until 10 minutes after 7. Um, I'll repeat the questions only because of the uh, television requirement. Do we have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, have you uh, heard of any plan or seen any signs which would lead to a 
peaceful resolution of the apartheid question in South Africa. And what chance do you give to a, to a peaceful solution? The question is, what chance do you give to a peaceful settlement of the apartheid issues in South Africa? Well, it's uh, very difficult to say because of the intransigence of the South African regime. In fact, as you may know, uh, the African National Congress, the ANC, which, is, uh, which was created in 1912, uh, since the beginning uh, was a non-violent organization and tried uh, through what we call strikes, uh, civil disobedience, uh, uh, to struggle against uh, the racism there, against apartheid. But they did not succeed until uh, they decided really to shift to what we call, they called the armed struggle. And the armed struggle the, is uh, developing uh, slowly. It's not easy because the repression is very strong there. More recently, we have uh, uh, seen uh, we, we had this strike uh, of the the miners, the trade unions uh, from of the miners, they joined uh, and uh, they decided to strike and it was something like 350,000 miners, black miners, that uh, stopped working. Uh, and uh, the result, well, uh, I cannot tell you, but I believe this is the way that uh, of non-violence to, pre but uh, apparently the government does not listen to, does not listen to reason. Any other, uh, another uh, violent, uh, peaceful mean would be sanctions against South Africa. And my, in my opinion, sanctions are in this moment the single most peaceful weapon that we have to solve this problem in South Africa. Because the way it is continuing, there will be bloodshed there. There will be a, war, a racial war. We'll call it civil war, but because they are all South Africans, both blacks and whites. But it will be a racial war with terrible consequences. Blacks massacring whites and whites massacring blacks. And I don't know uh, where it will lead to. We in Mozambique, we are not interested in this kind of war just beside our border. We are not interested. We have enough violence in Mozambique. Of our own, I mean. Yes, ma'am. Um, the first part of the question is uh, simply, I think, to comment on the success of SADC, S-A-D-C-C, as a uh, cooperative organization among the nations, the independent nations of your region. And the second part of the question, I believe, is if there were a, con a government in South Africa which was acceptable to countries such as Mozambique, what impact would that have on SADC? First, we created the SADC uh, to, to prevent uh, the domination of South Africa over our countries in the region. Because we want to be independent, really independent. We have the political independence. But you know, this, uh, this, uh, the South Africa was in fact a big power, and still the big power in the region, that uh, before independence was already, uh, had already the hegemony in the area both political and economic, and we become independent. And suddenly this hegemony is, is just becoming loose, and uh, that's why they're doing destabilization. This is in Mozambique, they're invading Angola, they're destabilizing Zambia, Zimbabwe, Swaziland. And uh, we can ask uh, what would uh, happen if there was a government of majority in South Africa? that would uh, take the same uh, stance. I mean, would like to dominate the, the region, playing the, the big power. 
we would not accept. And we, continue, we would continue to struggle against this domination because we want really to be independent, whether it be SADC, uh, South Africa, whether it be the United States, whether it be the Soviet Union to dominate our countries. It must be very clear, and it's clear in our minds. Yes, sir. Thank you for your speech, Ambassador. It's very uh, interesting and very informative. Uh, in southern, in South Africa, the country of South Africa, their strength depends uh, very greatly upon the uh, workforce, the black workforce they have. They wouldn't be as powerful as they are without that workforce. Uh, to what extent do you consider that the blacks in South Africa are really supportive of their government in as much as they continue to, to work in that fashion? Would you comment on the degree of support which the blacks of South Africa give to their government, especially as indicated by their continuing to work within that economy? Is that fair? Uh, I think the gentleman also asked about uh, the foreign workers. Foreign workers as well. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, all the, in fact, all the, the from all the countries in the region, there are workers going to work in South Africa, both in the mines, in industry, in plantations. Uh, people, who were workers from Mozambique go there. It didn't start now. It started all the way from the beginning, in the beginning of the century, with the development of the South African economy. And uh, we may estimate, for instance, that we may have as many as 500,000 Mozambicans and descendants living in South Africa today. Well, of course, being foreigners, they don't have any kind of rights. That normal black, they don't have any, uh, South African black, they don't have rights. For a bigger reason, foreigners. I mean, if they participate in any kind of trouble there, and in any kind of support or not support, they will be expelled from South Africa. Now, in the, the, the South African workers themselves, uh, themselves, uh, uh, then they have their own rights, uh, limited and so on. Uh, and very few, in fact, participate in the, uh, the political life there. Only those who accept uh, things like Bantustans and uh, uh, to work in the, the police uh, for repression, they accept. Uh, otherwise, the, the large majority are completely as left aside. And of course, they do not support the government there. We can very well imagine that. Yes, sir. If the citizens of Mozambique living in South Africa are that unsettled and unhappy there, why don't they simply go back home to Mozambique? The, the follow-up question to the previous question was, indeed, if there is discontent of a, a, a strong sort, why do the workers not return to their homeland? The immigrants that went there, they went to work to find jobs because they were not available in Mozambique. And um, we regret very much, but we are not in a position right now, because of the war, because of the stabilization, to give uh, employment to everyone in Mozambique. It is a, a, a situation. But the Mozambicans want to work. They have uh, families. They want to, uh, to, to give the, the, to, the normal life to their families. And they, go, they ask to go there, and they go. We cannot tell them. It, is inhuman, it would be inhumane on our side, to tell the Mozambicans, no, you cannot go there, even though your family will die of hunger because, uh, uh, because of the apartheid regime. As I told you, this tradition existed since the beginning of the century. And the Portuguese also did not, enough, <laughs> did not have enough jobs for every Mozambican. And uh, well, this tradition in some areas also it, it created uh, even those kind of traditions that are uh, like uh, uh, well, a male is only a male if he goes to the mines in South Africa and comes back alive. Then he can get married because he's really a male. You see, these are the kind of things that exist in some villages. And th in those those who cannot go, it's a problem. It's a problem because they don't they do not fulfill that part of the tradition. And they regret very much, uh, but. Uh, those Mozambicans that go there, they are submitted to the, to the oppression, as the others. Uh, recently, during the strikes uh, of the Mozambique, of the South African miners, 
the Mozambicans did not participate, and their colleagues, South African colleagues were not happy. <laughs> they were, in fact, uh, boycotting uh, uh, the strike uh, organized by the South Africans, and they could not, uh, they could not participate. They would be expelled, very simply. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you stated that the peaceful means of bringing the South African government to effect some changes would be through sanctions. Uh, one reads that sometimes the sanctions penalize the very people that they're uh, designed to help. And I wonder whether you'd comment on that and also uh, what countries in the world have brought effective sanctions against the government and does that affect any modification of their policies? Sorry. Uh, the question is, uh, how effective do you think sanctions actually can be in South Africa? And would you give examples of nations which have imposed sanctions and the degree of the impact which they've had? Well, uh, sanctions, uh, I've already heard this argument that, you know, if you apply sanctions, Poor Mozambique, uh, poor Zimbabwe will suffer, uh, Botswana and Swaziland and so on. And uh, I think uh, in Mozambique, I don't know what they would cripple more than what's crippled. I mean, <laughs> they have already destroyed <laughs> nearly everything. Uh, they need only to come to the ports and destroy the ports. <laughs> no, the others, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but to give. But, uh, I know also that when the, when the sanctions were applied against Rhodesia, the Rhodesians were continuing to have trade because there was violations. While Mozambique was a colony, Portugal was allowing uh, the Rhodesians to export and import through Mozambique. And after our independence, through South Africa, they're doing business with the world, uh, falsifying documents. In fact, I read some, somewhere that they were, we, we, Mozambique, were selling grain to Thailand. It was coming from South, from Rhodesia with false uh, certificates of origin, Mozambican, with true stamps and so on, seals, and everything was there. And so uh, now, we Mozambique, uh, if you apply sanctions, it won't affect uh, much uh, South Africa. I'm sure of that. Even Zimbabwe, or which has a much bigger trade uh, with South Africa, but uh, we say that those countries like Japan, United States. Uh, Germany, Italy, France, Switzerland, uh, those uh, Britain, those countries that have the most important trade and cooperation with South Africa, they should seize it and strictly implement it. If they apply it, the next day the apartheid will fall. But one thing, Mozambique should not be used as an excuse not to apply sanctions. Well, how many more years must we see children women, old people being killed in Mozambique, in South Africa, because we don't want to cripple the economy of Mozambique. Yes. Is, uh, would you elaborate more on the they that you spoke of when you're speaking of your own country in terms of um, they are destroying the projects and the factories? With respect to uh, destruction within Mozambique, uh, would you identify who it is who's, which is, uh, or who's causing that destruction? Well, the, the, the South Africans are using different methods. In some, uh, they're using the, this RNAMO, or MNR if you want, uh, who are Mozambicans, for the majority of the massacres, uh, the destruction of crops in the, the villages, to destroy the, those factories, sugar factories and tea processing factories I mentioned. And uh, for some uh, special installations, such as the bridges, like the bridge of, uh, over the river Pungwe in my own province, uh, in the center of the country, uh, it was destroyed by a commando of South Africa that came by submarine, and, uh, and they came by helicopter, they came over there, they destroyed and they left. We don't, didn't have enough uh, air force at the time to control it. Even today, we don't have uh, such a big air force of our own that could prevent this. We don't have radars and those things. 
there was also the destruction that was done by frogmen of, from South Africa of the oil tanks in my hometown, Beira, in uh, 1978, if I'm not mistaken, 77 or 78, that burned down several oil tanks belonging to Caltex, I think. So the, the, they used both the direct intervention of their own armed forces, as well as the surrogate terrorists of the Renamo. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for coming to talk with us today. Um, I have one comment and two questions. Um, your speech, uh, I was led to believe, was going to be concerning Mozambican policy, but perhaps you talk more about South Africa and how South Africa is the root problem of everything that's, that's wrong in Mozambique. Yes, and I think that I would be more interested in hearing a little bit about your own economic policies and perhaps the more communist-inspired government that you have that is now changing, but perhaps that you yourselves are responsible for some of your own economic problems. I'd like to hear a little bit about that. Secondly, I'd like to uh, comment on the SAPCC, which we talked about, which you mentioned. Um, do you think perhaps with regard to that you might tr be trying to, as we say in this country, reinvent the wheel? Um, South Africans, from what I understand, run the ports in Mozambique, they run the railroads. Your country is near collapse, and I'm not sure if it's all South Africa's fault. Perhaps it's partly the fault of your own policies. But I'm wondering if a more cooperative attitude with South Africa on the part of Mozambique and other countries might induce them to change their policies even more quickly. And lastly, lastly, <laughs> lastly um, a few years ago, it was the unfortunate death of your president, Michel, uh, shocking the world. And, and since then, there has been a, a very thorough investigation by Western aeronautical experts, including our own Frank Borman, who was a former astronaut, which came to the conclusion that it was the fault of the Soviet pilots of the plane. And with your government, and we, we also heard from the ambassador of Zimbabwe some months ago, insist the South African government planted a phony decoy to, to purposely killed President Mahel and all of his people on the plane. Despite the fact that a Western investigation has disproved this, I wonder what your government's position is on this official. Don't dignify this council. The first question is, would you, would you comment on the uh, extent to which the Marxist orientation of your government causes economic problems? The uh, second question is um, the second question is is uh, would you comment upon the degree to which it might be advisable to cooperate with South Africa in various areas and the third uh, if you would please the uh, the third question is would you comment upon the uh, Western and American uh, uh, comments on the, the causes of the death of your former president in the crash South and the and the fact that it appears that your government is claiming that South Africa was the cause rather than the causes which this apparently objective commission suggested. Three different questions. Let's start by the end because it's a very short uh, answer. We still believe that there was a fake, uh, a false decoy that was planted, and we are still investigating, with or without the support of the South African and your Western experts there. We'll find the truth and we'll let you know, the world know. We'll find the truth. I'm not able to say more, but I know that we're still investigating. Two. You know, how communist-oriented policies have created some good things in Mozambique also. The Western Christian civilization that was uh, with us, uh, with the Mozambican people, for 40, 450 years, till independence, created 93% illiteracy rate in Mozambique created racism in Mozambique, created 
things that we didn't know, like blacks should not own properties, created things like blacks, when they go into buses, like in my hometown, they should go behind, and there was a partition in the, in the bus, and whites in front. <laughs> blacks, if they are sick, they would go to hospitals for blacks. Blacks, when they would die, funeral, it was done, they would be put in bags, not in uh, coffins, because coffins were very expensive, and the blacks didn't earn that money. The communist-oriented policies of my country, my government, after independence, and from there till today, ah, one thing, there were no, not one single doctor in Mozambique. There was not one single lawyer. Blacks, I'm speaking, huh? Because I must tell you one thing, I'm not black, huh? You see my hair, huh? It's like yours, huh? I'm an Indian, Indian, from an Indian origin. My parents were from India. I was the son of settler there. And uh, there was no one single engineer, one single agronomist. The communist oriented uh, policies of my government lowered that illiteracy rate from 93% to 72% today. We have given, cre uh, allowed the, the students, uh, the Mozambican, to study in schools, and we have today, and we are proud to say that we have trained more than 1,000 doctors, engineers, agronomists, economists, lawyers, in 12 years, a little more than what was done in 450 years of the Christian Western mm -hmm. civilization of the Portuguese. When the, we became independent, there were 40 black priests in the Catholic Church. And 400 whites. Uh, I don't know what else. I should give you an example of the Marxist oriented. Ah, now Mozambicans can go to the hospitals. And they pay 20 American cents to be treated. Whereas before they wouldn't go to the, they would go to the to, to the hospital for blacks as they call. Today they go to wherever they want, and they will get all the treatment, even the most complicated operation, for twenty cents. <laughs> well, uh, well, in economy uh, we made mistakes. What did you want? Did you expect uh, us to do with seven percent uh, literacy rate in Mozambique? Not one single doctor, not one single lawyer, not one single economist. Perhaps uh, independence is a sin, and we should not be independent, and should <laughs> be continue to be dependent on <laughs> Portugal or South yeah. Africa. Yeah. Better to live poor than slave, you know. All right. All right. Poor and free, eh? Huh? I think the other question was, the, uh, is there any advantage in cooperating with South Africa? I think I said, better to live poor and free than the... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Your immediate problems are real. But there's one thing that we all have in common in this entire world. It's a disease called AIDS. <coughs> incubating in Africa and growing throughout the entire world. It's incubating in the United States. <laughs> What's your country helping? What are they doing to prevent any spread of this throughout the world? Uh, would you comment on what Mozambique is doing about the AIDS problem and uh, whatever additional comments you think are appropriate? Uh, we have a program that uh, of tracking the disease, uh, and right now we officially have only four people that are in the hospitals with the disease. <laughs> we have did uh, we have done a very extensive, uh, uh, I think we'd say is tracking in uh, tracking in uh, in English, uh, and rastreo. Uh, 
how to say research. this? Uh, research. Yes, uh, research. And uh, among the uh, urban population mainly, and of three main cities uh, in Mozambique, and uh, we keep on, we are very cooperating very well, uh, very much with the World Health Organization on this, and uh, we would welcome even the support of the United States in this field because you know that you have very big, big experience in the in this. Uh, <laughs> but it's not widespread. Like you know, I know that some countries it is widespread, but it's not uh, that widespread in Mozambique so far. Senator, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to compliment uh, this body uh, for this program, uh, for the programs that we have hearing from ambassadors from other countries, because uh, frankly, uh, this young man impressed me because he prepared for your lecture today. And I had planned to do the same thing, but I did not. I didn't have time. Well. Uh, what I want to say is um, we don't know enough about what's going on in the other countries. And uh, the fact that Mozambique is, a, uh, is under the domination of Union of South Africa, I am surprised to know that, wow. if that is true. Uh, I want to know something about your educational system. We want to know something about your housing and uh, certainly about how you uh, are able to, to uh, what's the word I want to use, with the South African government. Uh, I understand that your, your relationship with the government <coughs> is uh, something that is to be uh, certainly uh, not cherished. Um, there are several questions. One is, would you comment upon uh, the degree of influence which South Africa does manage to have in your, your country? Would you also comment upon your education and uh, housing policies? And, uh, and, and return again to this question of uh, how you cope with uh, the difficulty of uh, uh, dealing with a regime that obviously uh, uh, you're not happy with. Well, uh, first we are not being uh, we are not dominated by South Africa. We are an independent sovereign state, being destabilized by South Africa, being destabilized by South Africa. Uh, and problem of education, the the system of education that we have uh, allows all Mozambican children, those who can go, and those who that. Uh, uh, the RENAMU allows to go to school uh, in the primary level, in the high school level, and uh, finally in the university. It is uh, free in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the primary school level. In the secondary school level, we have already to pay some fees, and in the university, you, might get, uh, you must get a scholarship to study there. Uh, we have roughly 1.3 million uh, School, school uh, students in the elementary level, and uh, I don't know exactly, but I think right now it's 20,000 in the high schools and uh, 2,300 in the university. But education is a priority in our country, and uh, it is because of this that we have be, uh, we were able to train that uh, those cadres the, that I spoke, doctors and so on, in a short period of time. Uh, we have special faculties to train uh, teachers, to train uh, people, uh, to give uh, high school level to people uh, in a shorter period of time. Uh, again, these are, uh, they have scholarships for that. We allow workers to study. They do half school, half work. Some of them, they're full-time students, getting a salary directly from the, their enterprise or office. Uh, basically, this is the situation. It's a very long subject, you know, I'm trying to, to summarize it. Uh, in terms of uh, 
but the final part of the question, uh, I don't recall. What... Well, I, I think it's how you're, you're wrestling with perhaps the influences which South Africa does or can have upon your country, while at the same time uh, you being unhappy with the regime. <coughs> Uh, the influence of uh, the South Africa, well, you know, the relations that we have with, with South Africa are mainly of the to commercial the level. Say, meaning that uh, we had already this strong trade between Mozambique and South Africa before independence. Very strong. Uh, some investments, but uh, the, for instance, some factories were installed there with South African equipment. And uh, well, when you need spares, you must go to, to buy them, purchase them in South Africa. And we go and purchase them. We don't want to close our factories. We don't want to lay down workers. Right? So we are forced to do that. Uh, it is unhappy that they have the system. And uh, we believe that we could have much bigger trade and uh, business between South Africa and Mozambique if South Africa had not this regime of apartheid. I also would like to thank you very much for coming, Mr. Ambassador. This is truly an opportunity for me. I believe that Mozambique is termed a frontline state, is that correct? Meaning that in an armed struggle, if you would correct me, that your territories would be the first territories that would be assaulted or territories that would offer protection to refugees. Can you tell us if there is any cooperation, say, between you and Robert Mugabe or the other frontline states in order to protect your borders from assault or to give aid and refugee status to people that are coming uh, out of South Africa? Uh, would you comment upon the nature of the cooperation between your nation and other frontline nations of southern Africa with respect to uh, uh, defending yourselves and with respect to giving refuge to those who would be refugees from South Africa. The front line says we are six. There, besides Mozambique, there is uh, Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Angola. Uh, Angola and Mozambique having problems of war. South Africa back to wars. Uh, and invasions in the, the other countries are cooperating with our two, uh, the two more and more important victims of the apartheid in the region uh, to participate in the defense of our country. We have uh, Zimbabwean troops in Mozambique, mainly along the Beta railway line, Beta corridor as it's called, and we have also Tanzanian troops in a uh, smaller figure. Uh, we have also support from the other frontline states in sometimes in financial means or in logistical means.